Okay, so welcome everyone to this uh, webinar interview with Bob Kahn. Uh, let me briefly say who am I. So I'm, I was um, responsible for technology and methodology at the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics. So that's one institute of the Max Planck Society in Germany. And now I'm, I'm uh, participate, uh, uh, I'm member of the uh, Max Planck Computing and Data Center in Munich. And I'm very much active in the Research Data Alliance. But that's just uh, my short introduction. And now I should uh, uh, present uh, our special guest, Bob Kahn. So Bob, I think uh, you, you, the, the major point in your career came when you showed in 72 that 20 computers uh, can work together based on packet switching. And that led you obviously to the work on TCP IP, which you formulated together with Surf. With WinSurf. And later you brought, you were became the director of NDAPA of the Information Processing uh, uh, Technic Office uh, Department, and you got the chance to put your ideas into place uh, uh, since you were heading the uh, leading the strategic computer computing initiative. So th I think that's where we uh, why we uh, have to thank you guys that we all have TCP/IP. And that also this meeting works so wonderful across internet. So um, and then let me just add that uh, that in in '86 uh, I hope that's right. Bob uh, founded uh, CNRI, which is Corporation for National Research Initiatives, and which he is still leading. And and amongst other things, CNRI is responsible for the development of the handle system. So another numbering system. So uh, Bob, your 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 life obviously was very much attached to numbers, so IP numbers and now persistent identifier numbers. And, um, and uh, to just tell the audience, the participants, that we will not talk so much about TCP IP today, but much more about digital objects and uh, persistent identifiers. So I hope this is sufficient to introduce you. I could mention that you also got a lot of awards and uh, I think the most uh, important, um, uh, or, or how to say, for me, the most important award is the Turing Award, of course, which is a great award. And I was very f um, uh, triggered when I saw that you also got the Royal Award by Queen Elizabeth. So I uh, should just mention this. I hope this is sufficient to introduce you, Bob. So thanks for joining this interview. And if you don't want to add something special on your career, so we should just start with uh, the questions, some of the questions we present, we prepared. Well, that, that's fine. I'm more than happy to uh, you know, leave it at that and uh, to join you in this uh, web webinar. So, great. So, great. so let me just tell the others um, that we prepared uh, or some question, or I prepared some question exchanged uh, with Bob about this but uh, we will, if you have questions, uh, please uh, send them to Katrin. Katrin will post them to me and I will have a look from time to time to see whether they fit in the, in the course of our interaction. Well, Bob, um, the first point is a bit about the long development uh, uh, on, on persistent identifiers. So it was around 2000 uh, when we had to set, so my group had to set up a first real online repository to host non-reproducible cultural heritage data um, created by many humanities researchers worldwide. And there was certainly a persistence issue since we recorded cultural material and language material, and that was not reproducible. So when we, looking, when we were looking at that time for relevant and stable components, we were reading your and, and, and Wilensky's paper from 95 and we were immediately triggered and started uh, some years later assigning PIDs systematically. Although I must confess, looking back, that it was a bit of a toy at that moment. A few years later, the Max Planck Society was convinced that it should offer a stable PID service for all its institutes. But when we discussed this with the president and the IT council, we got a clear message you know, that uh, they can only uh, do this if uh, such a system is independent from one institution. Well, in the meantime, you managed to overcome all obstacles 
and set, set up the Swiss Donau Foundation called Digital Object Naming Architecture. So you addressed uh, our concerns from years ago. So my question to start would be, you know, can you imagine why we were triggered by your publication years ago? And uh, how do you see the development from the handle system at the beginning uh, to the Donau Foundation now? So um, let me just uh, see, you know, whether you have some some answers to this question and to this development. Well, the uh, a little bit of background on that paper that uh, Bob Wilinski and I wrote. Bob at, at the time was chair of the computer science department at the University of California in Berkeley. Um, and we had been, we at CNRI had been funded by DARPA to uh, uh, work with a number of universities around the United States, five of them in particular, to find a way to help them to digitize their uh, some of their gray literature, the, the material that wasn't in the normal publications, like uh, technical reports and, and things like that. Uh, they had quite a bit of material, and, and they picked uh, arguably uh, sort of four or five of the best in the country, and sort of every one of them were, were clearly in the top ten. Um, and Walensky was on that uh, that group representing Berkeley. I gave a presentation of what we were then calling um, the digital object architecture uh, to that group uh, in October of uh, 1993 at our very first uh, meeting that we got together to discuss uh, how to proceed collectively. And uh, it was very clear that uh, uh, that some of the concepts that we had in mind uh, were were fairly new or controversial to some of the attendees there. For example, the idea that you would have uh, semantics in the name of something was fine as far as the universities concer were concerned. For example, uh, you know, MIT said they were never going to sell their PhD theses and um, neither was Stanford or any of the other places. But we also knew that um, if we're dealing in the publishing world, that publishers often sell materials from one party to another. And so there was a question early on about uh, the use of, of semantics. And there were several other questions there as well. And since Bob Walensky was one of the um, more um, balanced uh, uh, parties in the group in terms of presentation, uh, they asked him to work with me on trying to write it down in a form that was kind of accessible to all and comfortable to all. So we spent about two years writing that paper. Um, what it tried to lay out was a framework in which you could manage information. And I think we succeeded in doing that pretty well. Um, we had been asked also before that started uh, to uh, uh, file a patent on it just to make sure that this could be maintained in the public interest, which we did. That patent has long since expired. And over the course of it, once it issued, we made it available to everybody who, who used the software um, without any charges or, or other constraints other than don't disrupt the system and keep your service available, that sort of stuff. So. I mean, I can easily see why you might have found it interesting because I think it was an initial attempt to describe how to manage information, of which your example is just one case, uh, in a way that had many of the same similar characteristics as the internet did. Namely, it was an open architecture description. It had defined you know, interfaces. Uh, it had... Uh, uh, a certain independence from the underlying technology, which meant that, you know, as computers changed and storage systems changed, that the basic architecture could continue to apply. You just kind of roll out the old technology and roll in the new. And in fact, if you look at the internet today, since uh, Vint, Vint and I first introduced the, uh, the notions of the TCP IP protocols, the internet has scaled up by about a factor of a million in the speed of the communication lines, about a million in the, 
the speed of the computers and roughly you can buy about a million times more memory for the same price. So this is a scale up of about a factor of a million without any fundamental change to the basic architecture and if it continues for another decade or two, the scale up will probably be more like a factor of a, a billion or maybe even closer to a trillion. Uh, that's very unusual in technology. I can't think of any other example where that scale up has been that large. And what we have here in the digital object architecture is an example of an architecture for managing information that allows that same kind of scale up. If you were to ask, um, you know, what's different here from the original um, internet architecture, it was all about moving the bits from one place to another. And it didn't really get into the details of what a user would do once they got their bits from one place to another. That's fingers on keyboards and eyes peeled to screens. However, um, you know, unlike many other uh, situations, um, a new technology showing up is only really useful if it can be seen as useful by the end users. So in this case, um, you know, what would the end users see other than their bits showing up there or them manipulating everything on the, key, on the keyboard. So this was a step further to introduce a way of managing information in a way that was independent of the underlying technology that was interoperable between all the parties, which was one of the key features of the internet, but at the machine level, and that allowed for built-in security and most importantly for the ability to manage that information uh, in a persistent fashion so that if it got referenced in journals and documents and other things that were stored digitally, <clears throat> that those identifiers that were used um, for this information would uniformly lead to it no matter when in the future you clicked on it if the information was properly managed. So that was the, the main goal and we introduced this formulation of digital objects which you think of them like the introduction of packets in the original packet switching world. Packets had, you know, addresses on them so you knew where to deliver them. Um, packets in the in the internet world had IP addresses, you know, which machine delivered them rather than which wire. And in the digital object world, every digital object has a unique identifier that's associated with it and if you somehow can you know, have a system behind it that will take that identifier and, and give you enough information to get the object, then you should be able to get it without having to change the identifiers. And that was essentially the system that was developed over time and which is in existence today. So I can easily see why you might have found it interesting. It's a pretty minimal description, just like you know the electrical power system in your house is a pretty minimal interface, namely it's a plug in the wall, but it, you know, it, it assumes that you have electrical appliances in your home that uh, you wish to to power with that. I think, Bob, if, if, if when I look back, one thing which we saw, uh, which we had uh, in our mind was that we immediately saw that uh, many of these objects which we had will wander, will uh, move around in the world and be stored at different places. Still, we wanted to have, uh, you know, one uh, identifier so that we know, okay, that's the thing, wherever the bit sequences are stored. And I think that still holds, right? This, this, uh, this idea of have one identifier to, to uh, point to the thing and, as such and not to instances where uh, bit sequences are stored. Well, Peter, if I could just point out that the formulation that, that we had originally, I don't know we, if we said it in such detail at the time, was that virtually everything that was in the internet environment would be identified. So the uh, users would be identified, the systems would be identified, the content, the information itself would be identified. You could have other things like flows in the network and the like being identified. And so the notion of an identifier wasn't so much a pointer to a thing like uh, a book or a journal, although it it could lead you there, but rather a an identifier for the object itself, which you then had to resolve to find out enough information about it to know what the next step was to take. 
So it's not so much a pointer as it is an identifier that you could resolve the state information about the object. So let me let me j come back to my my second part of the question. I mean, you started as you said, you know, with this uh, uh, project on gray literature, and finally you now managed to set up the Donor Foundation with a kind of worldwide, uh, how do you say, coverage or so, uh, and and that's quite a uh, development. And uh, you know, I wonder always what the motivations are, whether they are the same as our hopes in the Max Planck Society some time ago or so. You know, have something independent of uh, persons and, and institutions, which is just there as internet or so. Is that your motivation to set up Dona? Well, it was to try and, and make it possible for organizations that wanted to make use of the architecture and the technology associated with it um, to feel comfortable doing with it, I mean, using it. Um, in, within um, the U.S. And, and other places that were relatively friendly, um, there was no issue. We could have just continued to do what we were doing before. Um, but even within that context, and the Max Planck Society is one example, it was a question of what would happen if uh, an organization such as CNRI uh, was running it and decided to stop or went out of business or for some reason uh, couldn't provide that function any longer, then what? And um, you and I had some discussions on that um, along the way, and uh, what we had said was, well, our first question was, well, what would you do in other similar circumstances um, where you depend on an institution? And the answer was, well, if they're large enough, maybe they won't go away, and you can, you can think of all the places that like that would fit that categorization, I'm sure. But in the case of the uh, digital object architecture, the linchpin of that system were the identifiers, just like IP addresses are the linchpin in the internet. You need them to make the internet work in, in its current form. Uh, so the question was, what happens if we at CNRI didn't provide that linchpin service? And what you have to also understand is that the way that service ran, uh, it was really a a two-level system since uh, in the early days many organizations that we were dealing with said they wanted to be in charge of their own identifiers, create their own identifiers, resolve their own identifiers. And so the question then translated to something like the following. Um, if you have an identifier, how do you know what the right uh, repository might be to go get an object or you know, whatever, there could be, you know, very large number of repositories around the world. In fact, every individual potentially could have one in their PC, smartphone, or laptop. Um, which one of those do you go, given an identifier? Uh, so you needed some way to do the resolution. Uh, having a single system that had every one of those listed in it, it was probably uh, not a very viable solution, even if you replicated it around the world because the individual organizations wouldn't be in charge. So you needed to know which individual organization to go to to find out about the objects that they created. They might not even be stored right there. And so we devolved this into a, uh, a two-part system where there was a global registry that simply said, here are the um, places that will be able to create identifiers and, and make them known to the system. Uh, they had to be unique, and we gave them a number. That was how we started it. So in the case of uh, an organization, maybe we gave them the number 1,500, and so the, every identifier they would create would be of the form 1,500 slash some string of their choice. Semantic, numeric, it didn't really matter at that point, but the original number uh, was a numerical one, obviously. Um, so. What you would do is, with an identifier, and this would all be done in software, is the software would first go to the global registry, if it saw an identifier, and say, you know, who created this identifier? And the global registry would say, oh, this, this party over here maybe give you an IP address or domain name or some appropriate description of where to go to get the appropriate handle record. And that record would tell you enough about that object for you to be able to go and get it. You clearly wouldn't try every repository, there'd just be too many. 
but you couldn't try every local handle service either because there would be too many of them. So the global handle registry made it sort of easy to go in one stop to the right handle record and from there to go to the object itself. Now, um, in the case of uh, the, the different groups that were interested in using it, um, there, there were different uh, requirements that they had. And so in the case of Max Planck, um, if you recall, um, you had simply asked if we would work with you on a plan for what would happen in that case. And we said we would be more than happy to do that. Um, but in the case of others, they actually weren't happy with the plan. They wanted to actually know that this was not dependent on what you called any one institution, which in this case would be us. The fact of the matter is that even if you devolve to a Donna Foundation, that's actually a separate organization of its own. The question is what kind of you know, universal trust is there in that organization? And I think so far we've gotten quite a, quite a bit of positive uptake on this particular approach. Uh, what it does is provides a way for multiple parties around the globe to cooperate with each other uh, in, uh, in a coordinated fashion in order to um, manage the, uh, the, this global handle registry. But um, there were a couple of questions that were brought up earlier on. If you, if you just had you know, n, n such organizations, who would get to pick the next one if you wanted to add one more? And rather than make it, an, you know, an old boys club that was trying to figure that out, uh, it was said, well, maybe you need a separate place. And then the question was, for security purposes, um, there are certain records that needed to be signed in different ways, and there needed to be various checks and double checks and so forth. And how would that get managed and who would be in charge? And so these reasons dictated that there be some separate organization whose job was pretty limited in terms of interaction with external bodies, but functionally very central to the operation of that system. And that's where the idea of the Donna Foundation came from. The way you described it, uh, actually, I, I think the actual name when we had originally proposed it was the Digital Object Numbering Authority uh, for a variety of reasons um, because this was agreed to be an organization set up in Switzerland. Uh, the term authority was um, a reserved term for government use only. So we ended up just abbreviating it. And the name is the Dona Foundation, but we don't try and ascribe any meaning to the actual terms anymore. OK, uh, thanks, Bob. Uh, before I come to the second question, let me uh, see Stefan Kramer. Uh, ask a very specific question where we may, where you may have a short answer. So, um, does the assignment of a DOI, a DOI is a handle, uh, uh, at least from syntax, does the assignment of a DOI to uh, research outputs increase that discover discoverability? Do you have an answer to Stefan on this question? Did you, does it decrease its discoverability? Yes. I, I'm absolutely. Does it decrease it? Is that your question? Uh, no, uh, increase their discoverability. Increase the discoverability. Well, l l let me say there's a distinction between having an identifier. I mean, anybody can give an identifier to anything that they want. You could number everything in your house, one, two, three, four, five, and so forth, or maybe eins, zwei, drei, you know, and so forth. But um, the really critical question is if you could then resolve that identifier to something meaningful about the thing that you're identifying. So it's not the identifier as much as it is the method of resolving it. Now, that needs some structure, uh, and that needs some a way to deal with uh, um, you know, what the identifier means. Uh, I think that uh, uh, ultimately discoverability based on an identifier is not something that uh, uh, you can describe except in the context of systems that allow you to discover it. So um, there is a notion of registries that uh, we, we talked about. Uh, and a registry is simply a system that maintains metadata about the objects. So 
if there's enough metadata in those registries to allow a search of it to disclose what you're looking for, that's fine. Uh, my own view right from the get-go was that uh, these registries ought to be open to new and more powerful search mechanisms that the research community may come up with. So you could search on, you know, even today you can do a limited amount of searching on things like voice and sounds and the like, but those algorithms will surely become more powerful in the future. And there may be other ways of um, doing that as well. But uh, what uh, I think is really important is that the ability to discover something really depends upon the systems that are out there that make it available. That's not about what the handle system is about. The handle system is a, an identifier and resolution system. And if there are registries out there that you can search to find it, and we maintain them and we encourage people who are creating these objects to maintain them, that's fine. They can be private. They don't have to be all publicly accessible. They can be discoverable in private communities as well. But that, that's the essential uh, element of being able to discover it. And you focused on DOIs, but I would say this is true of any identifier that you can put in the form where it can be resolved by the resolution system. So any identifier can be made to look like a handle by just giving it a unique uh, identifier to distinguish it from all other identifiers in the globe. Perhaps the answer, or one, one answer or aspect of an answer to our uh, participant here, to our question, uh, questioning person is, you know, if we use the per persistent identifier in a systematic way, as for example, some do, and associate also uh, or uh, uh, a type with it that directs to metadata, well, then you can have a machine that, you know, uh, makes uh, uh, research outputs or digital objects more discoverable. I think it's this, isn't it the semester systematic use so that our machines can deal with these things? Well, I, I think ultimately it's the resolution mechanism that's important because um, if every time you got an identifier, you had to essentially ask, what system do I use to resolve this identifier? Uh, then you be, have to be able to know that you're, you've been uh, directed to the right resolution system because one may give you a different answer than another one, leads you to different information. Um, you don't want to have to go through that. And that was one of the, the topics that we debated intensely in the early parts of the internet. Um, you know, if you have all these different nets, it's possible that you can have multiple agreements between the parties. So if you wanted to communicate with the machine, you'd be first saying, well, what net is it on? And then how do I get to that net? And what protocols does it use? And uh, it becomes a, an impossible problem after a while if there are too many options and choices. I mean, one could live in a world with a handful of choices, perhaps, but uh, it really simplifies things if, you know, you, you can take that part of the problem off the table, particularly if it's not uh, something that becomes any competitive. Hmm. Maybe we move to the second question, which is a more technology-oriented one. We, you also, you already mentioned uh, or, or hinted to this, so let me... Um, just come back to uh, the point where you started with this gray literature and now seeing that people you know the our chinese colleagues you know uh, creating millions of pids or handles uh, to control their uh, food chain uh, supply or that you know our colleagues from climate modeling and others create millions of handles by just one simulation run so we come uh, to a completely different uh, dimension which you may have thought of uh, years, many years ago. And, uh, and uh, I would like to cite here Mark Parson, which, uh, our Secretary General of the Research Data Alliance. He said, we are, it seems that we are at the tipping point where PIDs are becoming the generic interoperability solution, of course, a very basic one. Uh, that means um, used by everyone for every digital object. So my question to you is, you know, when you when you when you designed the system years ago, and of course you you uh, worked on it, do you think we are ready technology uh, uh, technologically? We are ready to handle you know this this uh, this massive amount of handles or PIDs with the system as it is designed, or do we need to do more? Do you need to do more to do more? 
How would you see this? I mean, the, the requirements completely changed, right? Uh, well, at some level, the requirements haven't changed at all. Um, what you're talking about are use cases that put more demand on the system, perhaps. Um, you know, if, if you look at the numbers, I mean, you, you can have a very large number of these objects. Um, and the amount of data in the system, therefore, to, to cover them could be very large. Uh, on the other hand, the way this technology has been used today has generally been, you know, individuals um, either trying to re retrieve a piece of information. They're not generally trying to re retrieve 100 pieces of information a second. So the kind of loads on the system are very different than some of the loads with the current technologies that are available on the Internet. So we've been seeing um, very, um, uh, very manageable loads. I you know, it's a level of, uh, you know, 100 million kinds of things per month, uh, which any machine today would be very lightly loaded, even the least expensive machines. But, you know, one could always throw more power and more parallelism at this problem. I, I frankly think the test of an architecture ultimately is both its immediate usability uh, and its scalability over the long term. So you could have asked that question about the internet in the early days, but as I said before, it's now scaled by a factor of a million on the key components below and probably we'll have a few more orders of magnitude um, in the next uh, decade or so. So we'll, we'll, we'll actually see what goes on um, from actual use, but I think we are nowhere near the limits of what this technology can can sustain, even if you never upgraded the number of machines and even if you didn't use parallelism. So with both of those things surely likely to happen in the future, uh, I don't see that there's uh, a likely short-term issue. Now, in the long term, if the growth really does uh, pick up, then we'll have to take a much harder look at what needs to be done globally to handle the problem. But I think most organizations will deal with it themselves. I mean, all the scale up on the internet has been done by organizations making individual decisions about what to do. Now, there may be some things that are, you know, global parts of the infrastructure that they all share that need to kind of scale up accordingly. And we would take a look at that. And when I say we, I don't mean me or one or a small set of folks, but everybody who is involved in ensuring that this system works will have to put their heads together and understand whether there are any limitations. Um, I mean, if you go back to the history of the Internet, if um, you recall, Peter, when Vint and I published those first papers, we were talking about a, an increase in address space from the old 16-bit ARPANET space to a 32-bit IP address space. And we partitioned that into 8 bits for network thinking that 8 bits was surely going to handle all the networks we could imagine in the future to uh, uh, the rest of the 24 bits uh, of the 32 bit space were for the hosts on those nets. Within a very short time, the, inter the Ethernet uh, explosion occurred and we were basically going to run out of 8 bit address space within like a few months of starting this, this whole activity. So there was a major effort uh, put in place, and that once the problem was seen, figure out what to do with it. And we got to the, uh, you know, the class A, B, and C type network descriptions that persisted for a very long time until we ran out of IPv4 addresses. Now, you know, IPv6 has a lot more capacity. Could we run out of those? Well, people today would probably say, no, that's so many, I wouldn't worry about that, but we might. On the other hand, there are other issues that we might be able to deal with. So, for example, if you have, uh, you know, let's say 10 to the 10th digital objects in a repository somewhere, you can imagine somebody suggesting, well, let's give out 10 to the 10th IPv6 addresses, one to each of those objects. But my argument would be use an independent system, give it a separate identifier, and then direct your queries to that one machine through IPv6, uh, since that's something that would be supported globally, or even IPv4. 
So there are, there are ways to deal with these problems when they occur, and I suspect uh, any system that is in such widespread use will get that attention, and I don't see any potential problem that can't be solved in the future. But if that were to be the case, you know, 50, 100, 1,000 years from now, I'm sure somebody will come up with a better alternative. So when uh, when the I heard from Chinese colleagues, and, and you know as well from the board, um, that they are discussing a national identification system for all kinds of digital objects. And I heard the same fr um, rumors in the Internet of Things world. Um, is there any advice you would uh, would give? So uh, there are some people who say, look, let's use barcodes or let's use IP version 6, in fact. And, and uh, my feeling is always, you know, IP versions, uh, IP addresses are meant for conceptually different things than for uh, for uh, digital objects, right? But but what would be your advice? Obviously, you're not shocked by the idea that uh, you know uh, a huge nation like China wants to set up a national identification system, and you would probably say, well, the handle system could use it. You could use maybe the barcode as a suffix or whatsoever. But is there also something conceptually when when you say, look, when you hear that people, some people ask, good people, you know, let's use IP uh, uh, addresses for digital objects. Is that something which you say, you know, that's that's uh, conceptually wrong or how would you argue here? Yeah, I, I think using IP addresses uh, of any kind for digital objects is conceptually wrong because these objects, uh, you know, in principle can move around. I mean, in fact, the original notion of a repository we had came out of work that Vin, Vin Cerf and I did on mobile programs. So our thought was that a repository could, in fact, be a mobile program, and it would be constantly in motion. So I'm not even sure what IP address you would give to something that was always in motion. But um, I think, more importantly, uh, if you think of a device as uh, a thing that just produces you know, a piece of data or it's a sensor and actuator. Uh, that's a, a fairly limited way of thinking about it. So let, let me take an example. Uh, let's say a device was a, a, a temperature reader of some sort. So you can imagine you could sense it, get the temperature right then. Maybe it would give you the date and time as well, and then you're done. And if you try and sense it a little later, you get a different temperature reading. But I think a more general way to think about it is that you know, if you make it part of, maybe it's just got a chip on it that implements some of these protocols, it becomes a little information system in its own right. So you can interface with it and say, well, what's the average temperature here for the last day or week or something? Because it's got all of that information stored right there. Mm -hmm. um, so then interoperability becomes a very important point. But, you know, as long as you're dealing with identifiers, um, it really doesn't matter uh, exactly what identifier system you've been committed to in the past because you can always make that work with some kind of a resolution system. You need to resolve those identifiers to something meaningful to, so that a computer program or a person can use. So um, to me, the in critical thing is what's the resolution system. So if somebody in, in China, for example, I'm aware of uh, some of the work that they've done there. And if they have a QR code on a can of powdered milk, what you can do is mouse your smartphone over it and it'll produce the metadata about that particular product. So what the QR code is doing is simply conveying the identifier that's embedded within it. A barcode could convey an identifier that's conveyed within it if one wanted to. And you could use virtually any other system that somebody created to convey the identifiers. So I think you need to distinguish between the conveyance of the identifiers and the means by which they're conveyed from the actual identifier and the procedure that's then used behind the scenes to resolve it. So I would hope we get um, you know, some agreement on a common resolution system so you, you're not constantly having to say, well, what resolution system do I have to use? Because that could be a big security flaw in the system um, if people make the wrong choices. I have here one question, uh, and that's very much linked to what uh, we just discussed. Um, 
do you think about what do you think about identifiers for research equipment? I mean, I think it's very straightforward. Research equipments could be seen as uh, as um, objects, right, in our digital work world. I mean, they have their metadata, uh, whatever representations. So the physical devices, physical equipment have their metadata equivalents, and you know, then they are digital object in our world. What would you answer to our questioner here? Well, so, I, I mean, I would, I wouldn't say the metal. I wouldn't say the metal in the equipment or the plastic was the digital object, but rather, for these objects to be meaningful in, let's say, a, an online connected world, an internet world, they've got to have some form of uh, computing processing within them uh, of some sort. You know, maybe their chips sit act in a certain way, but. Um, you know, it's the interaction with those things that's really important. You could also have metadata about that equipment that becomes important, and people can both access the equipment itself, but they're accessing the equipment in, in, in terms of the digital object that's in it, maybe actions to and, and, and fro. If that piece of equipment is viewed as a, uh, let's say, a repository of some sort or a whole information system, then you're going to be asking it many different kinds of questions. So think about your car. If your car is not just a device, but it's a whole information system, it's got information about, you know, mileage, uh, usage of gasoline, uh, the efficiency of the engine, tire pressure, whatever it is that's in, in that car, then that's, that's a whole system interaction. And you're going to have to know how to ask questions of it the digital object architecture uh, is, is really uh, has a protocol for interfacing with these digital objects. And so unlike many of the other technologies that have been around, where you interface with a machine or a wire or some you know piece of technology, in this case, you can literally the protocol lets you interact with the digital object itself and ask questions of it. and those questions are are all um, identifier based. So you have an identifier for the action, you have an identifier for the target of the action, and you can, in, in fact, have a standard way of any of these information systems interacting with each other. Um, I think, uh, you know, a, a, an overview of that notion is in that ITU T recommendation X1255, but there are, um, you'll find on the internet a description of a digital object protocol or digital object interface protocol that um, describes it in even more detail. I know from some people running uh, big accelerator machines that, uh, you know, and, and, and these big machines, there's always uh, for every experiment, for every shot they are doing, there's some changes in, in software somewhere in these, these big machines, even if there are software filters, which they change. And what they do is they, uh, they, uh, put the configuration at that moment, uh, put them into a kind of metadata file, give it a digital object and cite them in papers. Of course, that's very straightforward. Uh, but one, one further question, which is about uh, stability and persistence. So, so we have the, the, we have the handle system. We have, uh, you uh, built the donut uh, uh, um, uh, framework around it. Um, what uh, we, I think we all see is that we are getting more and more, if we use this technology, which more and more people do, we're getting more and more dependent on the uh, availability of such services. And, and uh, you did a lot now with the donor uh, level, but uh, this is not all. Of course, we have on the national level or, or regional level, we have... Uh, um, um, PID service providers running handle systems or some uh, some other system. What is needed that we can um, sleep as well, uh, uh, relying on an available handle resolution system, uh, as we do for TCP/IP? Of course, TCP/IP, uh, all the infrastructure is meant to be a national. Uh, how do you say? Taken care by national governments and so forth. My English is not very good here, but I guess you understand what I mean, or at least I hope. So, what do we need to do to make sure that, for example, the German handle uh, uh, system provider is really there 
uh, you know, they can build uh, up uh, services on top of the handle system, you know, offer something uh, reliably and so forth. What do you think what is needed here? Is there, so it's not the technology, obviously, it's an organizational well, aspect. Well, if you really want to sleep well at night, a good bed and a good, good meal before would probably help. But um, let me, uh, let me suggest that, uh, you know, analogies may be better here. I, for, for one thing, I mean, the Internet itself doesn't quite have the same guarantees as, as I think your question would have implied. Um, I mean, the Internet itself is a very important and I think uh, groundbreaking example of cooperation and maybe coordination uh, as well on a global scale like we have seen in very few cases uh, that has worked over a very long period of time. Uh, there are there are decisions that can be made, you know, country by country for sure. I mean, they can disconnect themselves, but you know, for the for the for the most part, those decisions are not made because the downside of it is a lot worse than uh, than, than people would imagine. They really want to be part of this more global community. Uh, in the case of Another analogy that may be helpful is in airlines. If you're running an airline system, let's say in the U.S., and somebody, and, and let's say for the sake of argument, we are in charge of the global airspace, um, and somebody now wants to run an airplane service in another part of the world that we control, which we don't, obviously, um, nothing that they do there is likely to interfere with what we do here. So it's just enabling another part of the world to become part of what's going on. And of course, the natural question is, why should one party control the whole airspace? Well, that's a very good analogy for what we're talking about here. So what we've done with the Donna Foundation is moved to a form where the actual um, administration of, let's say, the airspace, in this case, the, the, the space of parties who can deal with the public, um, is uh, broad from one party, which was just us for the first 20 years, to now we've got seven um, entities around the globe that can do it, and we're going to grow that um, to a number more, but probably a dozen uh, within a year or two. Um, and so now you've got a choice of uh, seven or soon to be 12 places that you can go to get uh, uh, these identifier prefixes um, uh, given to you. So you can run local handle services of, of your own. You know, is it conceivable that that could be broadened out to a much larger group? Uh, yes, um, but f for one to feel comfortable doing that, you'd like to at least know that the technology is stable. I mean, this global registry we've run as a single control party system for 20 years, so we know that that's pretty stable. We're now moving into a cooperative venture, and we want to make sure that that's stable, just like the internet grew, but slowly at first. Uh, and then, you know, in time, if it proves that this is a workable technology and um, that all the appropriate means and mechanisms are in place to ensure it stays that way, uh, then I could see it growing to a, a larger number. Could we potentially have every country being responsible for something for its country? In principle, yes. Um, could we have a case where you know you've got you know at least one or, or two private sector firms that have global interests within that country, or maybe more uh, broadly? Yeah, I can see that happening too. But I wouldn't want to go from one party running it to suddenly having a thousand parties running it with no notion of how that's going to. Uh, how that's going to be protected and, and secured. So we want to do that uh, in measured steps. But, um, I mean, I don't see this as a government-by-government government kind of thing right now. It's uh, pretty much a, a private sector development stimulated by government research funds, to be sure, but one in which um, governments and the private sector have roles to play. But, I mean, uh, the, for example, I mean, I, I just uh, referred to the Max Planck uh, example but there are many others, of course. Uh, Max Planck, uh, president, said, "You know, we want the service for everyone in the reserve, in the organ scientific organization." So uh, they gave it a gay. So our our one of our centers gets the job. 
to do so and they get obviously some resources to do so and i think if we want to say look here is a, a system that works for the whole country or, or so that every researcher or every um, uh, repository uh, in, in in that country wants uh, should be able to use this we have to get some more effort and that can't be uh, the effort by the donor foundation that's something i think which uh, has to be done national wise or, or regional wise or organizational wise isn't it yeah i would think that's the case what the donor foundation can do is to make sure that there are policies and procedures in place that ensure this collection of uh, administrators work effectively in the in the public interest that's what the the aim and the goal is that there is a way of, uh, you know, overseeing uh, security of the system, that there's a way of uh, allowing it for it to grow, for discussion of collective technical issues. I mean, we have entertained uh, several meetings so far where we bring all the administrators together to share what their technical experience is so we can all learn. They all have different kinds of issues that they're dealing with. Um, and I think we're we're going to look for ways of even broadening that community even further. This is not new. I mean, we've had similar kinds of things in the past. Um, you know, in in the early days of the internet, there were only a handful of us making decisions today that become you know of global importance. We grew that little by little. We set up a lot of the social institutions, and I think as uh, as I expect, if the digital object technology uh, is adopted by industry, and that's that's really where the the power is going to come from. Um, but it's hard for industry to make that decision because they all start out thinking that maybe their technology will be king of the hill and be in charge of everything. But you know, we're in a different world now, you know, and and there are a lot of different organizations around the world that want to play a role, and countries that want to more rely on uh, domestic than, than international. So these are all issues that will be dealt with in the appropriate quarters and parties by the appropriate bodies. But, you know, for, for the most part, uh, they, they, they still need to play a role in here because they, they'll have inputs, they'll have suggestions. And if this ever gets into the tech, tech base writ large, rather than right now, you know, experts who are interested in, in dealing with uh, big data or their own kinds of issues or publishers, they're, they're making their own arrangements. But, you know, sooner or later, I think uh, it's going to be apparent to industry globally that there's an opportunity for them here to really play a role. And, you know, it will not only benefit everybody globally, but it will be good for their businesses as well. And so that's, that's, that's sort of where I see this going. And once that happens, they need to have a voice in this as well. Well, uh, the the meeting was scheduled for an hour. Do we have a few moments more than an hour, or how is your? We can, we can keep going, Peter. I'm okay. I'm <laughs> so uh, I may uh, may want uh, may have a look to uh, to the questions now or so, and then see what's what's written. And I start with the with the bottom, and we'll take up all the questions later, which were not addressed, and come back on this. So in some way. So let me start with the last question here. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts on the role of IRIs in the World Wide Web linked data approach as digital object identifiers? I don't know whether you know the IRIs, uh, Bob, uh, but let me put that question. Maybe you, I mean, we know the linked open data approach. So, what is your, do you have an answer here? Well, you know, I don't have a view of what every group that's interested in these areas should be doing. I mean, the, the web has been probably the dominant uh, system that the world has been using in, in recent years. It, it opened up the eyes of many people to what was possible. But it's not the only solution. And, you know, many people thought the ARPANET was the only solution for networking in the world. And then we showed, well, you could have multiple systems and they need to interconnect. And, I think you're going to see many different kinds of information systems developed in the future. So the real question there is going to be about interoperability. And, you know, I don't 
sit here with notions about what every one of those parties that are thinking about their own system should do to connect theirs in, I, I would simply say we need to make available to them information about what this overall architecture is, how it deals with interoperability, and then work with them to the extent that they have issues or questions to see if we can help guide them in useful directions. Recently, I had uh, the chance to, uh, to look at uh, at the identifier usage or usage of identifiers in the in the biodiversity the global biodiversity community and what i saw is that uh, uh, on the on the on the sheets of uh, which i uh, received that uh, there are various couple of different identifier systems in use right uh, and for years some to identify two uh, concepts or animals and so forth and what what the, the people struggle with actually is that the all these identifier schemes are not used systematically. It's not to blame anyone. That's just how it grew, and that uh, they uh, that you can't do how do you say systematic searches across all the um, um, different uh, 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 information system which you have with using the different these different identifier systems so so what you, what you saw is there that there is a lack of systematicity so now these people uh, think of uh, you know using handle system as a reference system you know to uh, add another identifier in fact to all these these uh, these information cards or whatever you call them you know to have one uh, reference system and 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 use that as a kind of backbone. Maybe that's uh, that goes in the direction of what you said about interoperability. So they they want to have a reference, a unique global reference system, you know, in the back as another identifier. So it's not the only one; it's another one. And then of well, course you have the I, identifiers too, the yeah, databases yeah, and so forth. I would say that I, I would say that uh, you know people are. People have their own identifier systems today. Uh, many have been around for a very long time. Um, and there will be more in the future. What's important is not what the identifiers are that have been used locally, uh, but the means by which they can be resolved by others. I mean, if, if the systems are all your systems used in a very local context, then you can provide whatever mechanism of resolution you want and it won't affect anybody because it's just anybody outside your, your world because nobody else will be able to, to deal with them. If you want other people outside your local environment to deal with it, then you need to have a way for them to resolve those identifiers into meaningful information. The nice thing about the handle system, which, you know, it's, it's functional operation is primarily resolution, uh, is that you can take any existing identifier and make it unique by just giving it a prefix. And that's one of the things that you get from these administrators of, of the Donna Foundation. So once you do that, you're guaranteed then it's globally unique and anybody around the globe can then resolve it if you provide uh, the means of uh, responding to a request of, of anybody from around the globe. So, I mean, if you don't use that one, someone's going to have to invent one that's just like it and make it, you know, such that it works around the globe. But we already have that, and I mean, this is not this is not something for which the Donna Foundation deals with customers. So they're just enabling administrators to be able to do this. And if we had a large enough number of administrators in the future, then uh, you know, you can find a, a local one to deal with, and it would then work globally just as well. So that's the real, the, that's the real vision here. Um, and I, I wouldn't worry about all the different identifier systems. What I would worry about is making them uniformly resolvable. Yeah. Here's another question, which I better read. So hello, Bob. In the context of DONA and the issues of finding trusted and sustainable governance for digital infrastructures, do you see any place for the promises of this intermediation using distributed ledgers to solve some of the, and then it stops, some of the, of these issues. Well, I mean, th this is one of the uh, interesting developments that's 
shown up in recent years. It, it came out of the uh, Bitcoin world. Uh, it's been um, repurposed in different ways by other parties. Uh, many people think distributed ledgers are, in fact, repositories of some sort. But the, the fact of the matter is that um, that's a particular uh, technological approach that was developed, as, as far as I can tell, to uh, ensure trust in the technology rather than necessarily the, the individual parties that were involved. Um, as a practical matter, uh, I think the security mechanisms that were built into the handle system, at least for the near term, are sufficient for that purpose. But that's one of the things that we're constantly monitoring and testing and, and exploring to, to be sure that that argument is right. We have discussed and have thought about maybe adding another component to the global part of the handle system, uh, the GHR, uh, to uh, provide a, the term we use is belt and suspenders. I mean, a belt is sufficient, suspenders, but belt and suspenders is sort of like a backup just in case uh, one of the others fails. So um, we could add that, but we don't think at the moment there's a need to do that. And you know, it raises also a number of other fundamental questions about who is the legal authority that can enter into it. If you you put your trust in a distributed ledger and and um, somebody challenges what's in that ledger for whatever reason, what is the ultimate recourse you have? Well, it's probably got to go into a government. Well, what government would be in? empowered here because, you know, like what government is in charge of the internet? There is no one, uh, despite the fact that many people thought the U.S. played a, a more central role, and, and it did for a while. Uh, but uh, I think as a practical matter, uh, we don't see the need for that right now. We, we are studying it, looking at it. Um, it's got some very interesting attributes. But you have to also weigh the advantages with the disadvantages because there's overhead in maintaining a system like that. Um, some of them have limitations. I mean, distributed ledger is not a defined term, as I understand it, that refers to only one party's system. But um, although maybe somebody's got a trademark on that term, I don't know that for a fact. Uh, that um, you know, you've got to be able to understand what is the recourse if that one fails, so uh, or somebody challenges it. Uh, so at the moment, I would say we're aware of it. Um, we are certainly looking at it. Uh, we don't think it's necessary. But if it turns out for some reason, we can see a reason for having belt and suspenders. Or maybe you know we find a weakness in the belt and we need suspenders, a weakness in the suspenders and we need a belt, then we will uh, consider both of them but right now. Not, not, not needed as far as we can tell. Maybe we uh, we uh, take up one other question and then maybe we'll come to uh, finishing the session. So um, one lady, uh, Bob, with whom we both stood uh, together at a whiteboard, uh, you maybe remember in the RDA, s standing on the whiteboard, you made some scribbles and there was another lady, I am not allowed to say names today, but... Yeah, this was uh, the first lady here in uh, Gothenburg, Sweden, as I recall. Yes, exactly. So maybe you remember that session. Uh, she asked, you know, should we use the concept of persistent identifier in the internet context while it would be very difficult to maintain the consistency and persistency? I think we touched this already, but maybe you have a, 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 a specific answer to... Uh, to this question? Well, you know, it, it gets into the definition of what does it mean to be persistent. I mean, I don't know how far back, you know, the enumeration of uh, things in mathematics go, but it, it's probably, you know, the Greeks and, and maybe before them, for all I know. So is one a persistent number or not? What, is, what, is, what does that, that mean? Well, maybe to you one is persistent and 
But if you try and define it, I think the only reasonable way to define it is in terms of the ability to resolve the identifier in, in a known context. So if you have a resolution system and you can resolve that identifier to meaningful information, that is, somebody has maintained it, then that's uh, what I would consider to be a persistent identifier. Uh, in fact, le letting you get eventually to the appropriate record for that. You call them PIDs. Uh, frankly, I think uh, the important thing is that we have agreement on what the resolution system is. And then you, and the identifiers literally can be called whatever they want in the context of that. So whether they're handles or PIDs or DOIs or ARCs or whatever they want to call them, it would be OK as far as I can tell. But persistence has got to be in the context of the resolution capability. And if you don't have agreement on the resolution capability, then you know it's not clear that you can't um, you know f fractionate that as well. And, and have some some, some down to the point that we all believe in the system in a system, and that we take care that this system survives right for some time. At a certain moment, there will be always breaks or so, but that's philosophical properly. But we need to take care that the system is there, and that's um, the reason why we were very um, respondent to the suggestions that we have an organization other than CNRI. Uh, with the oversight capability, and that's the thing where the trust would be placed that it will maintain this system. It doesn't operate it, doesn't deal with the customers, you know, any more than the air traffic control guys fly the airplanes, but it will maintain a kind of a, a, a persistent system there so that these identifiers will continue to resolve in the future. That's uh, sort of what we're all shooting for, and in fact, in the original documents that set that up, one of the things that we made particular uh, careful concern for was what happens if there is, for any reason, the foundation can't provide that function, that there is a logical basis for maintaining continuity of the resolution system and the, the functions that the administrators are doing uh, while something is put in place, in this case with the help of the Swiss government, to ensure stability of that system over the long term. Right. Bob, I think we should come to finishing the session. I had one question, you know, which is more personal. So uh, I guess I'm not the only one who is impressed by all your visions along the time and the efforts which you took, like uh, to set up the Donau Foundation. But, uh, you know, how will it go on? How, what do you see for yourself? So when do you have time enough to do, as I call it, do kayaking with me and, and you know, and uh, in the wilderness somewhere with bears and, and I think you call them mountain lions or whatsoever. So when, when do you hand over? What is your, what are your plans, uh, Bob? Well, first of all, I'm a, I'm a whitewater canoeist, although I haven't done it recently, so not, I shied away from kayaking. But uh, you know, those are fun things to do, and I, you know, there are several activities like that that I, I do enjoy on the athletic side. I was much more athletic as a young, younger person. I you know, was into squash and tennis. I still am into golf, and I don't do whitewater canoeing anymore. But uh, I like to ski if I ever get on the slopes. Um, you know. You know, when people usually retire from universities, they, they love the work that they're doing. You know, I've often called retirement just an accounting change because they go on some other system of they keep their offices, they keep working with students because that's what they love to do. You know, as long as uh, my health keeps up, as long as my energy levels are up, as long as I'm, you know, interested in doing what I'm doing, I will keep at it. I've got some really strong... Uh, uh, support along the way. Uh, my wife Patrice is a uh, is is a lawyer and, and a budding technologist who has uh, been involved in almost every step of this along the way. Um, in the earlier days, I worked very closely with Vint and others in helping to put some of the social structures and the internet in place, as well as the technology, as you know. So um, you have to ask you have to ask the question: What what is retirement? I mean. If, if if you don't like, I'm sorry. We will see you for a couple of years in big events, small events. 
Well, I, th I think for a while, but I mean, no organization can be um, fundamentally based on a single individual. So we have within the Donor Foundation, uh, you know, certain procedures. And at some point, I'll step down from that, and we will you know, elect somebody else in there to to play the role. Hopefully, the culture and the means will have been well enough defined at that point, so we'll be on a good track. Um, you know, we'll be bringing in more people. We have nine members of the board right now. We have room to grow it to 25 or so. So I'd like to see some younger people on the board. So we have uh, not only a mix of, you know, wisdom from the past, not necessarily my own, but, you know, others as well, um, and uh, that we bring new people on board and, and grow it. That's the essence of anything that's going to survive. It's got to it's got to be picked up by the younger generation and handed off to their next generations as well. That's what I that's what I see happening here as well. Bob, thanks a lot for this session. I see here lots of thanks uh, from uh, participants. They now drop off, but there are very good comments, interesting discussion, and so forth and so forth. So thanks a lot, Bob. We'll see each other next week, I guess, right? So thanks a lot. And looking forward to it. Greetings to Patrice. Ciao. Thanks, Pete.